Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 25 of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. And we are back on Zoom, uh, unfortunately not in person, back up at, uh, at college uh, for on my end. And this time we are covering the myths of the Iroquois people, the Native Americans that lived from around the Ontario region as far south as around Tennessee in North America. What would you think of this section? My end is in Jefferson County. Y- your what? <laughs> you said uh, you were back in college on your end. Yes, that is true. And I'm on my end. In Jefferson County. In Jefferson County, Missouri. That is true. That, that, is, a, that is a verifiable fact. Uh, what uh, was your question again? <laughs> it's the same question I always ask. What would you think of this chapter? Um, that is a very long pause. Yes, I apologize. I'm trying to articulate. Uh, there's some good, some bad. How about that? Do you the, want me to elaborate or you want me to wait till the end? I think we can elaborate as we're going through the stories, probably. The, the, I thought there was a lot of common themes Mm -hmm. with other myths you know the duality Mm -hmm. you know they're they're light and dark Mm -hmm. uh kind of twin twin powers Mm -hmm. of creation and destruction um and creation in the image of the creator you know like humans being created so a lot a lot of a lot of uh, interesting themes i didn't know anything about these neither did i we're going in basically completely blind yeah i mean i knew the history um, and I do want to note, can I, can I make a note? Yes, you can, of course, always make a note. Uh, I thought this was the most, uh, political of introductions by the author, um, and, uh, apologetic. Well, I, I don't think I mentioned, we are of course reading Jake Jackson's Myths and Legends. I don't know if I said that at the beginning of this episode, a book describing world mythologies. And we have just started the Native American section, having just finished the Indian section. You know, his, uh, I, I, I'm guessing a little bit, but it seemed like his descriptions of Indian mythology and folklore, he's a big fan. Mm-hmm. Fast, you know, really seemed to be enthusiastic about it. And it, it seemed like in the Native American, he's like, he just wants to apologize for the poor troubles these, these people are uh, at the hands of the white man, right? And, uh, and it's, that's all fair and good, and it's all mm-hmm. fair play. But then he fails to realize that um, like the Iroquois mm-hmm. uh, and the other Indians Uh-oh. were at war with each other, yes. you know, uh, and 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 ultimately uh, a- allied themselves with uh, the uh, w- uh, European powers to kill other Indians, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like, yeah, do they? Yeah, they were they forced off their land? Yeah, just like a lot of peoples were forced off their land, mm-hmm. um, you know. So it's it's not unique to history, and mm-hmm. I don't I didn't see that kind of apologetics with regard to other uh, myths and fables, and so sure. I just want to make that note. Yes, thank you for that note. Relating more to um, mythology, I also wanted to comment on part of his introduction uh, because he kind of you know goes along that same framework, saying you know we've unfortunately don't have many of these tales left, you know, due to this and that kind of what you mentioned. Um, But I don't think that's very unique uh, to Native American mythology. I feel like that's a common theme throughout stories across the world. In fact, I feel like it's rarer to have as much material as we do, for example, the Norse or the Greek or the Chinese. It's rarer to have a lot of material about a mythology than to have very little material about a mythology. So I don't know if this is uh, extraordinary in the, the little information that we have. Yeah, and it's rarer still when you are illiterate nomads. (laughs) Nomads and people wipe out your community. There's nothing written down for mm-hmm. people to read later. You know, I talked about 500 languages being spoken in North America. Um, yeah, they're all dialects. It's all verbal, and nothing, nobody wrote anything down. So how, how do you going? Uh, that you know the lamentations of that. It, like you said, it's it's very very common. Mm-hmm. So like, how many different peoples or dialects or languages were there in France before it was unified? as a single country who knows i don't know but well it's funny that you say that because france is known for having still today uh, just an extraordinary amount of different languages even within uh, france's borders right right and so that's the reason why i was using that example part but uh, anyways i yeah it's you know and i'm not disagreeing with what he was saying you know but it's um I, i just get tired of these modern day moralists who blame a certain, uh, basically the, the most recent victors in these never-ending fights over territory. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I mean, th these these tribes went back and forth and um, and murdered each other and mm -hmm. uh, uh, raped and pillaged, just like all humans have. Yeah. But through the course of time, and 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 you know, it goes back to my general philosophy that you know, society and and religion especially is what. Uh, uh, cause it, 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 the best part of society and especially the best part of religion is the character building and the restraint mm -hmm. of those uh, natural passions, passionate extremes and injustice and all that stuff. But that's my little soapbox. Yes. Well, that was a nice little spiel. We should probably get into some of the stories because this was a longer chapter. Maybe you should talk about mythology. Maybe maybe we should. That's kind of what our, our podcast focuses on. <laughs> So we start off with the story of the creation myth of the Iroquois. At the dawn of creation, the universe consisted of two separate worlds, a lower world of eternal darkness peopled by the creatures of the water, and an upper world of bright light inhabited by the great ruler and his family. The goddess Ada Hensik, daughter of the great ruler, was pregnant at this time, and her relatives convinced her to lay on a bed to rest. But as she did so, the bed began to sink through the clouds, plunging rapidly towards the lower world. Seeing this descending light, the creatures of the water held a council to decide what should be done, and the water hen declared that they must find a place where the being could fall safely. The beaver proclaimed that only the Oeda, the earth at the bottom of the water, could support the being, and so he dived down but never returned. The duck also dove down, but soon his body floated back to the surface, and so the muskrat stepped forward, as he knew the way better than anyone. But first he asked who would support the heavy Oeda, and the turtle agreed to hold it. The muskrat then claimed some of this oeda and smoothed it onto the turtle's back, and it began to spread rapidly. And so two birds flew up and bore the goddess down onto the turtle's back, on which a large landmass had formed. From then on, the turtle was known as the earth bearer, and whenever there are great waves, that is the turtle stirring. Laying on this new island, Ada Hensek began to hear two voices in her womb, one soft and soothing, the other loud and aggressive. One of these twins sought to leave his mother from under the side of her arm, but the other held him back, and so they each entered their world in their own way. The first bringing trouble and strife, the second bringing freedom and peace, and so she named them Hagwadiu, meaning the good mind, and Hagwadatka, meaning the bad mind. Not long after, Ada Hensek passed away and the island grew dark, and so Hagwadiu molded the sky with his fingers, and then took his mother's head from her body and placed it in the firmament, where it became the sun. Hagwadatka then saw this, and so placed darkness in the west sky, forcing the sun down behind it. But Hagwadiu would not be beaten, and so he placed a portion of his mother's breast in the darkness to be the moon, and he surrounded it with numerous spots of light, naming them the stars and ordering them to regulate days, nights, seasons, and years. Hagwadiu then gave the rest of his mother's body to the barren earth, which created life, and he continued this creation, making the landscape, animals, thunder, and wind, but he saw that a greater being was needed to possess the great island, and so he made two images of his likeness from dust, naming them the real people and he breathed into their nostrils, giving them living souls. Hagwadiu then went in search of his brother, hoping to persuade him away from evil, but Hagwadatka was already destroying the landscape, making lethal reptiles to injure mankind, putting ferocious monsters in the sea, and gathering hurricanes in the sky. The bad mind also made two clay figures in the shape of humans to make a superior race, but he was not blessed with the same creative power as the good mind. When he breathed life into them, they became hideous apes, and he was so angry that only combat to the death would calm him. Coming to the good mind, the bad mind challenged him to combat, and he accepted, and the bad mind then asked what weapon would cause him the most injury, saying that he would avoid using it as a show of goodwill. Hagwadiu saw through this, saying that he would be struck down by a lotus arrow. Hagwadatka boasted that he feared nothing, but Hagwadiu knew that the horns of a stag terrified him. The battle began and lasted two days and two nights, and finally the bad mind shot a lotus arrow, but the good mind charged at him with the stag horns, impaling him until he begged for mercy. Hagwadiu banished his brother beneath the world, flinging the beasts and monsters down with him, but some remained on earth as servers, half humans and half beasts, eager to continue the work of the bad mind, who was now known as the evil spirit. Hagwadiu carried on his good work, creating life and teaching the people to make fire and raise crops, until it was time for him to return to his celestial home. That was a very long story there, the creation myth. I really liked that story. What did you think of the story? Yeah, yeah, a neat uh, story. Very uh, common themes to other mythology, you know, about the, the twin forces of nature, so mm -hmm. to speak, or human nature, maybe, and creation and destruction, and banishment to the underworld and the other world, and that kind of stuff. 
Uh, but it, it reminded me, the turtle reminded me of a oh boy. Was a funny story. So there was a story about this brilliant astrophysicist that was giving a lecture about the origins of the Earth and the you know, Big Bang or whatever it was, and, and a world-renowned intellectual. And at the end of the speech, an old man who's in the audience shuffles up to him and says, uh, I'm sorry, Sonny. I think you got it all wrong. And uh, he says, oh, yeah, how so? He says, yeah, the Earth, it's, it's resting on a giant turtle. And so he says, so the brilliant physicist says, oh, oh okay, well, what's underneath the turtle? And he says, it's another turtle underneath that turtle. He says, what's underneath that turtle? And he says, I'm sorry, Sonny, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut to the chase and solve this riddle for you. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> I still don't. You've told me that story so many times. I still don't get the point of it. What does that mean? It means that's the answer. The, it, it, there's turtles all the way down. It's, I, I don't get why it's so funny, though. <laughs> you don't think it's funny? I think it's funny. I just don't understand why it's funny. I don't know why it's funny either. I, you can't think too much about a funny story or a joke. That is true. That is true. Well, what, So other than the uh, famous turtles all the way down, mm-hmm. and I use that as a reference to... What is something at its core? Uh, you know, like he's turtles all the way down. Mm-hmm. You know, there's... Anyway, but what, what, are you, what are your thoughts about this creation story? Well, I like that you brought up like the duality thing um, because that's a very big thing in a lot of Native American uh, cultures. I don't know if it's particular to the Iroquois or if it's uh, a different Native American group, but all of their gods and goddesses existed in pairs. You did not have like a goddess by, a god by themselves without also having like a companion with them. Um, so we might see some of that here, like we saw with the good mind and the bad mind. I don't know if that's 100% applicable to the Iroquois, but duality was definitely a very, very big thing. I mean, we saw it again, even at the very beginning, there's a lower world and upper world. Um, and that's just the way things are. Things are very much split into twos. Yeah. It's a very yin and yang. It is. It is indeed. It's, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it, you know, maybe they inherited that coming across the Bering Strait. I guess it's possible. That's a, that's a fantastic theory. Although it's, I mean, it's pretty common to religions and uh, mythology, mm-hmm. about, you know, the good and the bad and the struggle between the two and that stuff. That is true. That is true. What do you think? I, I do think so. The next story is that of the origin of medicine. In the old days, the human race was expanding rapidly, and soon the animals had to find new homes in the forest and deserts. And when man began to make weapons, the animals began to consider measures to protect themselves. The bear tribe then met under their leader, White Bear, and they agreed that the only way to be safe was through war with humanity. But the issue of weapons was an obstacle to this plan. One of the elders then suggested that they use weapons themselves, and so they fashioned a bow out of wood and strung it with a piece of a bear's gut. The strongest bear then tested it, pulling it back easily, but his claws tangled in the string and he missed a shot. So he trimmed his claws, this time hitting his mark. However, White Bear was displeased, for if they all cut their claws, they would not be able to climb trees and hunt, and so the bears scattered back into the forests with no plan to attack humanity. I I have a a thought about this stupid White Bear leader. Everybody knows you're not going to have an entire army of archers. (laughs) Infantry. So (laughs) just because the one guy had to clip his nails, a paw on one hand, by the way, Mm -hmm. Because the other paw is wrapped around the bow, I would assume. Mm-hmm. And, and quite frankly, if you can't pull the bow string back with a bear claw, mm-hmm. what are you even doing? You know, I mean, it, that'd be perfect. But, but I digress. That is true. Thank you for critiquing the, the plan of the, the mythical white bear. Also, I okay. wanted to mention that for some reason, the uh, Native Americans thought the best bear was white. And also, <laughs> a lot of allusions to goodness being light and badness being dark. So take that, all you PC people out there. You know, these people, PC people out there uh, think that it's racist for white people to make allusions to goodness being light and, you know, badness being dark. It's a common thing for, for many societies because... You know what? If you're living in a tent or a teepee or something and it's dark outside, it's a lot more dangerous than it's bright sunshine. That is true. That is true. Thank you for that. Uh, another rant in this episode. 
I'm in, a, I'm in a ranty mood about this. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll, going back to my original comments. So oh, no. This is what set me off. So, you know, he's talking about an introduction to this topic, and he says, uh, it is a world we cannot possibly enter, however, without feeling a profound sense of shame and loss. I feel no shame about <laughs> the, the uh, uh, wars that happened between the Europeans and the Native Americans back in the, what, 1400s? 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. I don't feel any shame or loss from that. I don't feel any more shame or loss from that than I do for all the Indians that died in various, I mean, you know, real Indians over in India. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, or, or the, the Irish that were uh, 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 killed, murdered by the English, you mm-hmm. know, or by any of these peoples. Why do I, why should we, why, he insists that we all feel shame and loss because one, not even one, because there are many people mm-hmm. uh, that are considered Native Americans that we're all, all at war with each other, that we're illiterate nomads or illiterate <gasps> um, uh, farmers mm-hmm. um, with no written language mm-hmm. to preserve their society, no running water, uh, no septic, no development of any sort mm-hmm. over thousands of years other than they could plant some crops and they can hunt some buffalo. I, I will say, just, just to... Just to... I'm exaggerating. Yes. I know that th- there are there are several Native American groups that were very successful and made very uh, large cities and did have forms of writing systems. So it wasn't across the board. But... You're talking about the Incas and Aztecs down in South America. Yes, or Central America. They sacrifice people? Yeah. The, the, the tens of thousands of if human sacrifices down there, they're, they're better than... We should, should we feel a profound <laughs> sense of shame and loss? <gasps> the people that did human sacrifices... Uh, are no longer around to do that. That's not what I was saying. I was just saying that that broadly, uh, there were much more advanced Native American civilizations in other parts of of the the continent. Yeah, but we're talking about North America in this chapter, aren't we? That that is true. That is true. We're talking about the the Iroquois. I'm sorry that that comment in his book I thought was just it's over the top. Mm-hmm. I think. You can approach the subject to be fair, and these people were murdered. Mm-hmm. And then the smallpox wiped them out, man. Yeah. I mean, all the other illnesses that they, they were not immune to, that's really what killed the vast majority of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a, a terribly human tragedy, like other terrible human tragedies. I, I don't really mean to minimize it, but I'm tired of it being glorified mm-hmm. and promoted ad nauseum mm-hmm. anytime you raise the subject. I, I do agree with him that we can feel a great sense of loss, like just the, the stories that we, we, we can't you know, reclaim, but just as much as we can about any other civilization whose stories we have lost. I can feel just as much loss about you know, the, the ancient Greek stories that have been lost or the, the ancient Norse, the ancient Chinese stories that we no longer have. Well, right. And, and, uh, and yes, and, and the languages. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, I, the one thing I thought was, gosh, you know, it's, it's too bad there wasn't anybody able to record any of these. But mm-hmm. you know, thank goodness we, we've developed to a certain point, not through uh, being illiterate nomads, but through Western scientific advancements that we can now record people and preserve those types of things. True, true. What do you think of that? I'm, I'm on a complete rant-a-thon in this episode. You really are. Uh, go, where even were we? The, the bears were having their council. White bear shot down the idea of uh, them all trimming their claws because then they could not hunt. Um, so then we move on to the deer, who were holding a similar council under their chief, Little Deer. And they decided that if any deer was killed without the hunter asking for pardon, he would be struck down with rheumatism. And so it still is today that whenever a deer is killed, Little Deer moves faster than the wind and asks the dying deer if the hunter asked for pardon. If the answer is no, Little Deer tracks him down and paralyzes him with the rheumatism. The fish and rap- reptiles quickly decided that whoever tortured or killed them would be tormented with nightmarish visions, causing them to refuse all food, sicken, and die. The birds, insects, and smaller creatures then met under the grub worm, who asked every creature to come forward and state his opinion on mankind. And if they all agreed that mankind was uh, awful, then all of mankind would be destroyed. The frog leapt forward describing how mankind beat him, giving him permanent spots on his back, and the birds described how humans roasted them over a fire. All the animals had a string of criticisms, except for the ground squirrel, and soon they created various lethal diseases, and as this list of illnesses grew longer, the grub worm fell over with laughter and would not rise, and so he still wriggles today. 
Only the plants remained friendly to men, and so they all promised some remedy to the diseases, and every tribe then had a shaman who was capable of hearing the voices of plants and determining which would cure diseases. So it was that medicine was made, ensuring the survival of the human race, which was so close to destruction. So aside from your already existing rants, what did you think about this story about the origin of medicine? Well, maybe you should share your thoughts since I already wrote out my rant. That is true. I, I mean, I like the story. I mean, it's a neat concept um, uh, that all of the animals hate humanity. And I mean, I guess it could kind of make sense um, because, you know, what I understand about a lot of Native American beliefs, which is not a lot, uh, but they were very animist, um, you know, being sort of one with nature and relying on nature for everything. Um, and we saw particularly with, you know, asking for pardon before killing the deer, you know, he doesn't, the, the hunter doesn't want to kill the deer, but it's necessary for his own survival. And so he asks for pardon. Uh, so it is kind of a neat concept that, you know, all the animals would like for humanity to die and then all the plants are friendly, which I mean, would make sense if you were, you know, a hunter living, um, you know, in ancient times, uh, essentially, you know what is more likely to kill you, an animal or a plant? And they describe all these diseases. That they, they, all these animals give me all these diseases, and it must make sense that they are out to get me, and the plants are on my side, essentially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it would make me want to go to war with the deer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it would. You know, why, why wouldn't you? I mean, the bears are okay because they just kind of quit. They dispersed. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, the, the fish are supposed to give me bad dreams. Screw them. Go to spear fishing. <laughs> That's what my thought is. That one with nature. These people are trying to kill me. That I just kill a deer every once in a while to, to survive, and they're organizing a, you know, a. It's really kind of like a, a, a mass murder. Mm-hmm. I'm just killing to eat. They just want to kill us. They're that, not going to eat us. That is I true. Want to murder the human race by poisoning us. Mm-hmm. That is that is a that is a valid point. I'm not a one with that nature. <laughs> <laughs> you are fiery tonight. Us, us and the plants versus everybody else. Although the bears are neutral now, I guess, because the, no, they don't want to clip their claws. Hey, that's true. That is true. I also thought it was interesting. I mean, this is two stories in a row that we've seen the animals holding a council, uh, similar to just how humans would hold a council. So I guess that, that that would kind of play into what I was talking about earlier, kind of being, you know, equal to, uh, to animals, really. Um and sort of the being on the same plane, you know, neither is really better than the other, um, according to like this sort of viewpoint. They have councils just in the same way that we do. Yeah, interesting. It is interesting. They're illiterates too, the the, the uh, deer and the fish. That is true. I don't know if you should be comparing the Native Americans to deer and fish, but... I'm not comparing them. I'm just mentioning how those councils are never had any minutes. You know, you need to have a secretary and keep minutes of the meetings. That's why the bears really broke up. They're like, we could, they, hey, what did we decide last month? I don't know. Who wrote it down? I couldn't write it down. I got these damn claws. Can't hold a pencil. <laughs> you, you know, you have a point, I guess. All right, we're going to move on to the next story, uh, which is the legend of Hiawatha. Many legends are told about the former Iroquois chief Hiawatha, who lived in the 16th century and formed the original Five Nations Confederacy. The legend told here is based on that story told by a 19th century Onondaga chief. Along the banks of Teoto, there lived an eminent young warrior named Hiawatha, also known as the Wise Man. And no one knew where he came from, and he owned a magic canoe that he moved by his force of will alone. Hiawatha gave the villagers advice on growing corn, and he taught them to remove obstructions from watercourses and clean their fishing grounds. He provided them with wise laws and proverbs, and so the villagers began to believe that he had been sent by the Great Spirit himself. After a time, Hiawatha joined the Onondaga tribe, and he was elevated to a p- position just beneath Chief Atotarho, and under Hiawatha's guidance, all other tribes yielded to their superiority. One day, a great alarm was raised for the Huron, ancient enemies of the Iroquois, were invading and indiscriminately slaughtering people. So Hiawatha called... Wait. Oh, dear. Wait. Those those peaceful, at one with nature, Native Americans, the Hurons, were were killing people indiscriminately? I believe they were. Oh, God, that just completely blows my mind. Go ahead. (laughs) Thank you. I I, I assumed you you would interject there. Uh, where was I? And so Hiawatha called for a meeting. You were at where the Hurons were killing indiscriminately. Thank you for the reminder. I, I appreciate it. 
And so because, like you said, the Hurons were uh, slaughtering indiscriminately, Hiawatha called for a meeting of all the tribes at the Onondaga Lake. However, when the people gathered, there was no sign of Hiawatha, and after three days, messengers went to his home, where they found him sitting on the ground, seized by a feeling that a tragedy would occur if he attended the meeting. But the messengers persuaded him to come, and so he set out in his canoe with his daughter. As the people saw him, they cheered, but as Hiawatha approached, he saw a dark form descending from above, and the crowd scattered. But Hiawatha stood still, for he considered it cowardly and futile to escape the designs of the Great Spirit, and he instructed his daughter to stay with him too. The object approached faster, and it was revealed to be the shape of a gigantic white heron, and it fell onto his daughter with a mighty crash, killing her instantly. In anguish, Hiawatha instructed several warriors to move the bird's carcass, but there was not a trace of the girl beneath it, and in silence Hiawatha plucked a snow-white feather and decorated his costume. And the other warriors did the same, and since this event, a heron's feather was used by the Onondagas as on the warpath. On the first day of the council, Hiawatha listened to the plans of the different chiefs, and on the second, he addressed his people strongly. I'm going to read straight from the book here because I like this section. My friends and brothers, listen to what I say to you. It would be a very foolish thing to challenge these northern invaders and individual tribes. Only by uniting in a common band of brotherhood may we hope to succeed. Let us do this, and we shall swiftly drive the enemy from our land. You, the Mohawks, sitting under the shadow of the great tree, whose roots sink deep into the earth, you shall be the first nation, because you are warlike and mighty. You, the Onedas, who recline your bodies against the impenetrable stone, you shall be the second nation, because you have never failed to give wise counsel. You, the Onondagas, who occupy the land at the foot of the great hills, because you are so gifted in speech, you shall be the third nation. You, the Senecas, who reside in the depths of the forest, you shall be the fourth nation, because of your cunning and speed in the hunt. And you, the Cayugas, who roam the prairies and possess great wisdom, you shall be the fifth nation, because you understand more than any of us how to raise corn and build lodges. Unite ye five nations, for if we form this powerful alliance, the Great Spirit will smile down on us, and we shall remain free, prosperous, and happy. But if we remain as we are, always at variance with each other, he will frown upon us, and we shall be enslaved or left to perish in the war storm. Brother, these are the words of Hiawatha. I have said all that I have to say. On the following day, Hiawatha's great plan was considered and adopted by the council. Once more, he stood up and addressed the people with wise words of counsel, but even as his speech drew to a close, he was being summoned back to the skies by the great spirit. Hiawatha went down to the shore and assumed the seat in his canoe, satisfied within that his mission to the Iroquois had been accomplished. Strange music was heard on the air at that moment, and while the wandering multitude stood gazing at their beloved chief, he was silently wafted from sight, and they never saw him again. At which point the slaughter of the Hurons began. (laughs) In all likelihood, yes, probably. Oh, those peaceful, loving, nature-loving Native Americans. You are really hammering this point home this episode, aren't you? Uh, But the, uh, it was a neat neat story. Mm -hmm. Origin of a great leader and uh, with great sage advice Mm -hmm. to uh, a disparate peoples. True. Much like George Washington to the uh, separate colonies to join as a nation and throw off the uh, uh, Great Britain, England. That is also true. I, I like this section. I really liked um, that passage that I read there, um, just hearing like the, the characteristics of the different tribes. I'm always interested in hearing, you know, how these different cultures kind of split themselves up. You know, what are the main characteristics of our neighbors and our, our kinsmen? It's very interesting how he calls them all together, uh, you know, again, to form this great confederacy, which was very, very powerful um, for several hundred years, I believe, because uh, this happened in like the 1400s. They were around um, really for a very long time uh, during the colonial period. So this was a very powerful group of people in, in uh, North America. Yep. Yep. True, true. Good point. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I'm glad that that, that was your, your wonderful insight there. Wait, 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 argue with you? <laughs> Not particularly. Um, it's a good point. Yes, thank you. The next story is that of Ganasqua, the last of the stone giants. As a final measure to rid themselves of the stone giants, the Iroquois called upon the upholder of the heavens, Tahahawagon, to help them. And so the god turned himself into a stone giant and placed himself among the most influential of their tribes for they were so impressed with his strength that they made him chief. Tahahiawagan then led them to a, f- uh, to a fort of the Onondagas, where he commanded them to lie in a deep hollow in the valley. And as they slept during the night, he carved great boulders out of a nearby mountain and then kicked them down into the land below. Crushing the giants, and only one survived, 
This was Ganusqua, and he fled to the Laleke Mountains, where he hid in a cave until he grew to a great size. No human had ever laid eyes on Ganasqua, for to look into his face would cause instant death. He was only vulnerable at the base of his foot, and no mortal could kill him. And so Ganusqua rampaged through the earth, changing the course of rivers, punching tunnels through mountains, eating herds of buffalo, and even war uh, warning the thunderous to stay away from his cave during storms. During one such storm, a hunter took refuge inside a cave and drifted to sleep, but was later roused by the rock itself moving, and he heard a strange noise, and he felt a giant hand on his shoulder and a loud voice in his ear, for this was Ganusqua's cave. However, the giant ordered him to close his eyes and not look at him, for the hunter had only come for shelter and not to kill Ganusqua, and so Ganusqua said that he would spare the hunter's life if he obeyed the giant's commands. He ordered the hunter to live amongst the animals and dedicate his life to them, and so he must go out and fell a strong tree and carve an image of an animal in it, and the tree will then speak when it is first struck, and that will be Ganusqua's voice. The hunter then went out, finding himself seated at the base of a basswood tree, which transformed into a mask and began relating its power to him, for the mask was the supreme being of the forest. Uh, so reading from the book here, the mask... Uh, could see behind the stars, it could conjure up storms and summon the sunshine. It knew the remedy for each disease and could overpower death. The venomous reptiles knew its threat and avoided its path. It knew every poisonous root and could repel their evil influence. The mask then ordered the hunter to carve many gagonsasuk, or false faces, and he met many animals carving their images into basswood. And he carved all the language, and he excuse me, and he learned all the languages of the animals and plants, and he learned to love every being. Reading from the book again, a great many years were passed in this way until the hunter, who had entered the cave as a youth, had become an old man, vented to with the burden of the Gagan Sasu he carried with him from place to place. At last he heard the voice of Ganusqua, pronouncing an end to his labor, and soon the mask appeared to guide him back to his own people. He wondered if they had the strength to make the journey, but he refused to abandon what he now considered his most precious possessions, the hundreds of Gogan Sasu that he had carved in basswood. Wearily he set off on the track, almost crushed by his heavy load, but after only a short time, he felt a sudden surge of energy. Slowly, his spine began to uncurl, his back began to broaden and strengthen, and he felt himself growing taller until he had become a giant in stature, rising high above the trees. He stood up tall and proud and smiled, unaware that in the distance, a great cave had begun to crumble. What did you think of this story? What was the, the, the message here? I don't know. I, I thought it was kind of a weird, long story about some stone dude. That is true. I mean, I guess it kind of goes back to, to what I was saying about the, the animism, you know, being one with nature and that, of course. That's what you got out of it? Um, that and, I guess it was sort of don't judge someone by their appearance. Um, uh, I, I picked up kind of a little bit of that moral in there, you know. The, this hunter is the first one to go into this cave, not wanting to kill this stone giant. And in exchange, um, the stone giant helps him become one with nature and then eventually return back to his people much stronger and wiser than he was before. Yeah, the hunter was kind of lucky because he didn't even know he was there. He fell asleep. That is true. That is that is very true. He wouldn't have killed the guy. He just didn't know he was there. I was oh, my gosh, I woke up and there's this dude staring at me. He's showing me a stone. And the stone guy's like, oh, thanks for not trying to kill me. I'm not going to reward you. <laughs> All this stuff. <laughs> Congratulations, you broke into my house. Yes. Here is some vast wisdom. Yes. I don't know, it's kind of a weird story. I didn't, I didn't know what to make of it. Yeah, it was interesting, though. I, I kind of liked it. I kind of liked it. I kind of didn't. No, uh, that doesn't surprise me. I had a reason why. Hmm. To make a connection to the Lord of the Rings, because I think we're like contractually obligated to do that, there's stone giants uh, of a very similar appearance, at least in the, the Hobbit movies, um, An Unexpected Journey. It gets seen by the, like, uh, Gandalf hits his staff on that, that rock, splits it in two, and the sun hits them when they're about to cook them up. No, those are cave trolls. Oh, what, what are you talking As about? As they're going into the mountains, like, the mountains themselves are big giants throwing stones at each other. Yeah. Which might not be, you know, 100% accurate to the book, but it was a cool scene in the movie. It was a very cool scene, yeah. And unbelievable that those dwarves and everybody else would survive that battle. Yes, yes. It was fun to watch. Very beautiful scene. Beautiful Great, scene. uh animation cinematography i like to imagine that one of those is ganusqua but he was the last one so oh he was the last one died, I guess. that is true that is true and then he killed off the other ones and then became the last one that is possible that is very possible that fight didn't he get a, like a rock to the head and fall over yeah yeah in that scene yeah one of them got like his head like completely taken off by a big stone right that was right. pretty cool that was pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> good thoughts good commentary moving on to the next story great head and the ten brothers 
which is not a bad band but name but you'd have to have it'd be like a big horn section or something that is true you'd have to have a lot of people in that band you have to have one dude the great head actually she could be a girl mm-hmm. so she had a giant enormous head mm-hmm. uh, it'd be great head and the 10 you know ten brothers that would be a pretty cool name it would be a good name i, I might take that actually if I can find eleven, or if I can find ten dudes to form a band with me. Uh, well, you you don't have a big head. That is true. I'd have to find one dude with a big head and nine other people to to form a band with me. I think it'd be better to ha- find a, a a young lady. Mm. With an enormous head. That is true. That's true. Pretty unusual. I don't know if I've seen many women with a giant head. I don't know. That's well, that's that's something to think about. You can you can tweet at us if you know of someone with a really big head. Tweet at us. Let us know at ULMTD Opinions on Twitter. My newest project now is going to be if I see a woman with a giant head out in public, I'm going to take a picture of her and send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> or if she can play an instrument. <laughs> I think that is a terrible idea. You want to join our band? Giant head. <laughs> Brothers. Uh, Brother. Oh, my God. Okay. So, the story goes that ten orphan brothers lived in a small lodge with their uncle, and every day the five eldest went out to hunt. But one day they did not return, so the younger brothers set out one by one to find them. But they never returned either until there was only one young brother left, and his uncle became very protective of him, never allowing the boy to leave his side. One day, when gathering firewood, they heard the groan of a human voice coming from within the earth, and they began digging frantically unearthing a mysterious man who could remember nothing about himself other than that he had been hunting when his mind suddenly went blank. The old man and his nephew asked him to stay with them, and it soon became clear that he was not an ordinary mortal, for he didn't eat nor sleep, yet still gained strength every day. When it rained, he behaved strangely, tossing restlessly and calling out in a curious language. One night, during a particularly violent storm, the man declared that the noise of the storm was his brother Greathead, riding on the wind, and the old man asked if he would like to invite Greathead in. The man declared that he would like to see him, but he could only be brought in by magic, and the uncle and his nephew ought to prepare him a meal of ten blocks of maple wood, because that was his favorite food. The stranger then set out, coming to Greathead's dwelling and transforming into a mole so as to not be noticed, and there he saw Greathead lunging at a helpless owl, and so the mole stood up and fired an arrow at his brother, and as it flew towards him, it grew larger and larger, but just as it was about to hit its mark, it returned to the mole, and Greathead then pursued these arrows, with each one bringing him closer to the lodge. Greathead then burst through the doors of the lodge, and its occupants beat him with wooden mallets. But Greathead just laughed, for he felt no pain, and the sight of his brother made him rejoice, and he gladly ate the maple blocks provided for him. When he had done this, he asked how to repay the uncle and his nephew, and so they told him of their missing brothers, and he proclaimed that they had fallen into the hands of a witch. The uncle then gave his nephew consent to go out with Greathead alone and find his brothers, and they soon came to a hunt, hut in front of which were many bones. And seeing the two approach, a witch in the doorway began chanting spells, but they had no effect on Greathead, and the young boy was protected by Greathead's shadow. The youth then lunged forward, killing the witch with his bare hands, and her flesh turned into black feathered birds. He then set about selecting the bones of his brothers, and when he had made nine separate mounds, Greathead departed back to his rock, first telling the boy not to despair, for he would return soon. At a loss for what to do, the boy saw a storm approaching and took shelter, but he then saw Greathead riding at the center of the storm. Arise, you bones, Greathead yelled. I bid you come to life. The hurricane passed overhead in an instant, as rapidly as it had first appeared. The young boy felt certain that he must have been dreaming, but then he observed that the mounds had disappeared. In a moment, he was surrounded by his brothers, and huge tears of relief and joy flooded down his cheeks. This is an interesting story. Uh, Again, one that I'm not entirely sure what to make of, Um, Other than that there is some sort of dichotomy presented here, another sort of duality between what I guess is sort of like an earth figure and a storm figure um, being two brothers. Um, And the the storm figure is characterized very interestingly, um, notably, you know, being named Greathead, uh, this this big figure riding at the the front of the storm. But he's completely impervious to to any damage or magic. Um, It seems to me almost sort of a a spirit of the storm in a way. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. I just wanted to know what the the uncle and the little boy what what was in their heads when they said, let's get him with these wooden mallets. <laughs> <laughs> that that was my favorite part of the story. 
And I thought they should have first asked for forgiveness for hitting with wooden mallets and then asked for help with uh, fighting the, the nine brothers. Thing. But That is true. Maybe, maybe the author just skipped over that. Uh, forgive me for hitting you in the head with a wooden mallet. Mm. I feel like that's more of just a, a, a device used to display how strong Greathead is to, to demonstrate his impervability to any pain. Yeah, laughed at the wooden mallet striking things. Mm-hmm. True, true, true. It, I'm having flashbacks of the 90s rock band Big Head Todd and the Monsters. Is that a thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They had like a number one hit, certainly a top five. I have never heard of them. Well, you have to Google Madougal it at the end of the episode and, you know, listen to Big Head Todd and the Monsters. And when you hear it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Hmm. I don't really like it. <laughs> it's kind of pleasant. They, they, can't, they can't compare to Big Head and the Ten Brothers, though. That, that's a far superior band. Uh, correct. That's true. That's correct. Yeah. This is a divine inspiration from the Native American mythology. True, true, true. The last story in our section on Iroquois mythology is that of Sayadio in the Magic Cup. Many months had passed since Sayadio had lost his 12-year-old sister to the Land of Souls, and worried that his grief would never be silenced, he called upon his Manito for help, and it told him that his mourning would cease when he had followed the path of his sister to the Land of Souls. And it doesn't tell us what a manito is uh, in this reading here, but I looked it up. It's sort of um, an ever-present spirit. Um, and it seems to me like um, each person's kind of assigned one, almost uh, in a way, like a, like a guardian angel. Everyone has a personal uh, sort of spirit in this uh, story here. Siadio so set out. Hold on. you think they'd be able to work shifts. <laughs> you mean each, each manito? Yeah, yeah, I mean... What about all those people on the night shift? You know, we're just sleeping half the time, well, a third of the time. That is true. That's true. That's a that's a good point. You'd be able to handle like get like three people. Mm. You know, because you're not always in need of your minito. Yeah, that, that's a good. That it's a not very efficient of them. Sadio then set out, but the path was never ending. And after months of traveling, he finally came upon an old white bearded man carrying a silver drinking vessel. When Sajio offered him help, the man simply said that his only purpose was to give Sajio the silver gourd, which would allow him to catch his sister's spirit. Sajio carried on, finally coming to the land of souls, and he called his sister's name, but the spirits only fled before him. Now at that particular time, the dead were due to gather for a dance ceremony presided over by the holder of the heavens, Taran Yawego, and soon a drum began to beat and a flute played, and the spirits thronged in a circle, and Sajio saw his sister and attempted to catch her in the gourd but she dissolved into thin air before him. Defeated, Sajio made an appeal to Taranuago to help him capture her soul, so Taranuago gave his magic uh, rattle that would allow him to succeed if he shook it when the spirits began to gather. Shortly before sunset, the spirits gathered again, and as Sajio shook his, the rattle, his sister froze, and he was able to catch her in the gourd, ignoring her cries for liberty. Coming back home, Sajio called together all of his friends and family to enact the sacred rite of resurrection, and all was prepared when the village idiot rushed forward and lifted the lid off the gourd in curiosity, allowing the spirit to fly into the air. Siagio called out to her, but she made no response, and returned to his lodge in despair, where he again heard the voice of his manito. Reading again from the book, The spirit of your sister was not destined for this mortal world, the voice explained. She is happy in her new home, so be at peace and cease your mourning. Siagio listened, and his grief suddenly abandoned him. And from that day forth, he never again attempted to recall his sister from the dead. A legend from the Wyandotte tribe of the Iroquois. I really liked this story, actually. This was, this was my favorite out of this whole reading. Very, very sad. Oh, you think so? Mm-hmm. I don't think, I don't think that's sad. I think it's, well, it's sad for Sajo, I guess. But Really, by the end, he comes to accept. I mean, mm-hmm. his sister's happy in their version of heaven or the afterworld or mm-hmm. whatever. I thought it was a... It was a story to console someone who is really d- uh, sad about the loss of a loved one and that they can be reassured that they're, if not in a better place, certainly in a good place. Mm-hmm. That, that's true. I guess I was just meaning the, the overall theme of, you know, 12-year-old girl dying and her brother is desperately trying to, to bring her back is, is a little sad. But in the end, it is. It is. I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. But yeah, but I, I really like the story. I liked the message of, you know, you can't really change something that big you know that's that's permanent essentially and even though they do have this you know right of resurrection and all that sort of thing uh, it seems like it's not going to work if the the soul does not want it to work you know if you're if the soul's content um, in the afterlife then that's just the way things are and you have to move on don't you think it's weird that there are no modern day um 
attempts or thoughts about bringing someone back from the dead that you know of well, well you know like these are these stories like in greek mythology and, and this this myth they seem pretty common about mm-hmm. trying to go to the underworld and bring somebody back and sometimes they're successful mm-hmm. they come back for visits or the seasons or whatever the case may be but like the modern day there's no modern day religious or mythological beliefs that i'm aware of that believe in or tell any story of anybody or has a concept of anybody being able to bring someone back mm-hmm. from somebody who's clearly dead as yeah. opposed to, you know, giving them CPR or whatever. Mm-hmm. I guess we just kind of learned at some point, you know, collectively as humanity that, you know, we've tried so many times. I mean, like you said, we have Greek myths about it. And now we're seeing these Native American myths about it and there's stories about it all over the place, you know, that they never actually work. You know, nobody has successfully brought somebody back to life. I mean, that we know of. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, I guess it's pointless to, to continue making myths about it if it's not going to happen. Well, maybe we should keep trying to do it. I guess that's true. I guess that's true. That'll be your mission. After I die, try to bring me back. <laughs> I'll get right on it. And then I'll be like a big ghoul and I'll want to like eat brains or something. <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> Don't you think that's a little odd that there was such a theme in all these old stories that at some point they stopped coming back? You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. It just seems well, are they? Are they? Compl- cause, I mean, I mean, we do have things like Frankenstein. I mean, it's not like a, a religious thing, but I, I, I do think, still think it is a theme in pop culture of of people trying to bring back loved ones. That's true, like zombies, I guess. Yeah. Well, wasn't uh, Inception kind of about that? Jesus, but that's like a whole different thing. Yes. This is more of a common thing. But, but isn't the movie Inception kind of about that? About the, the guy... Oh, you've never seen Inception? Never seen Inception. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, I, f- I forget. It's such a confusing plot. But briefly, you can control yourself in a dream, and then there, there's dreams within dreams. Um, and at one point, uh, and you have to, like, kill yourself to get into, like, the, the, the... To get to approach the real world, essentially, if you're if you're in a dream within a dream. Um, and the main character of the movie, Leonardo DiCaprio, whoever he's playing, um, he convinced his wife uh, to kill herself in a dream to bring her back to the waking world. Uh, but then when she was in the waking world, um, she killed herself for real. Um, and so the whole movie is him trying to bring her back, go back into her his memories or something and like relive time with her. He's convinced that that she that it was a dream at one. I don't know, it's confusing. But the point is that this, this, the, there is a theme of I want to bring my loved one back. Yeah, I guess that's true. Like in pop culture, which would be our modern myths, mm-hmm. storytelling and morality tales. True. All right. I stand corrected. You know what's really good is a uh, old Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland movie, uh, Flatliners. Hmm. Uh, I think that's what it's called. It has um, Julie Roberts, Kiefer Sutherland. I think Ch- Kevin Bacon may be in it. And uh, they're like med school students that uh, cause themselves to die. Mm. Uh, like flatline for a period of time and then they they go into the spirit world and then their buddies you know uh zap them mm-hmm. uh, and bring them back to life hmm. there's, a, there's a morality tale to it as well it's pretty interesting stuff pretty spooky and then kind of uplifting and odd hmm. fascinating speaking of an all-star cast we found a great concert we were just talking about this before the show um they might buy up the tickets. That, that is true. That is true. But it's been a long time since we've mentioned anything about uh, 60s music, even though that's in the description of our of our podcast. I didn't know that was in the description. That is in the description of our podcast, yeah. Start mentioning. I'll, I'll, I'll create references. Oh, perfect. But uh, my favorite artist of all time, Booker T. Jones of Booker T. and the MGs, and then his later solo career, amazing keyboard organ player, uh, will be performing uh, back in St. Louis. So that'll be, a, that'll be a, September. in September. We got a way to, to get you to meet him. Yeah, we do. We do. I mean, assuming that he's, you know, we don't want to kidnap him. But, uh, <laughs> why, 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 why is that the first thing that you thought of? Well, it seemed kind of threatening that we, mm. to meet, you know, but, you know, assuming there's some sort of, you know, public appearance that he might meet fans or something. We got to, we got to get on that. True. Uh, and, you know, he, he's, he, I don't know the guy. Uh, I've never seen an interview. Have you ever seen him interviewed? Mm-hmm. I have. I didn't know you read his biography, but. You would think that as somebody at his stage in his career would be pretty cool with, uh, you know, younger people appreciating his mm-hmm. brilliance, you know. I hope so. Yeah, don't you think? 
I would. I think so. He, I mean, I've seen interviews of him. He seems just like a really nice guy. I mean, at this point, he's in his 70s, I think, uh, over 75. So he's kind of just this mild-mannered old keyboard player, and he's, he just seems like a genuinely nice guy. Yeah, we got we got to check that out. We'll we'll definitely hit that. Yeah, Get some tickets and go. True, very true. All right. Do you have any other closing thoughts um, that aren't full of rage uh, about the the myths of the Iroquois? Well, you know, I should probably, you know, have a disclaimer of some sorts. I I, I think they're valuable people. Mm-hmm. They had uh, interesting societies, and uh, and uh, these are really uh, neat stories. Uh, creation stories they're similar to other creation stories but they have their own unique flavor which which is pretty cool Mm -hmm. Uh, with the overwrought uh, descriptions of their oppression as if that's not a common theme throughout all human history that is fair that is a fair point I think we might end it there on that note I've been Adam Bishop I am still Mark Bishop and this has been Unlimited Opinions Mm -hmm.